October 2022. The Infecting Minds project kicks off at Cheney School, Oxford, UK. How do you think vaccines work? This project addresses vaccine hesitancy through work with schools, both in the UK and South Africa. What do you think maybe stops people taking a vaccine? What do you think worries people about them? I think maybe it's the community, but yeah, social media, etc. And also peer pressure. Understanding barriers to vaccination and learning how beliefs and behaviours around vaccines develop, persist and spread can help prevent infecting minds and move from hesitancy to dialogue and acceptance. The aim also is to develop an interdisciplinary group of professionals to explore narratives and history of vaccine hesitancy and to develop public engagement around this topic. Over the last few years, vaccine hesitancy has actually featured as one of the top 10 challenges for global health worldwide. I'm Philippa Matthews. I'm an infectious diseases doctor and I lead a research group at the Francis Crick Institute. I'm from the UK, from London. Um, and we've got lots of other doctors, scientists, social scientists, public engagement. We are the ARI public engagement team. ARI stands for Africa Health Research Institute. My name is Welcome Bogazi. I'm in monitoring and evaluation officer. I am Zaman Tsembo, uh, a youth engagement officer. My name is Lutando Zuma. I am based here in Durban campus, Ari, where I work as a public engagement officer. So today, what we expect is for you guys to engage more with us. Like We want to receive more information and all your, your ideas regarding this project. We wanted to engage school students because we realise that they're so key in terms of understanding what's going on in our populations. They themselves have a huge influence already in their communities and their families. My name is Sally, um, I am also from the UK. I live in Oxford, about an hour from London. My name's Dr Sally Frampton and I'm a historian at the University of Oxford. And we felt like there was a bigger story to tell about vaccine hesitancy, um, the genealogy of this problem, where it came from, why it's different according to time and place. And so we came together to create this project, Infecting Minds. People worry about Western medicine, that everything's divided up, isn't it? It's not always feeling like it's treating the whole person. Vaccine hesitancy is an incredibly complex issue. It's never about just being pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine. Um, different vaccines present different challenges uh, within different spaces and within different periods of time. Um, that's why I think looking at the history of it is so important because it illuminates uh, the complexity and the challenges of vaccine hesitancy. Gosh, there's something so raw about that and so like emotive, isn't it? I mean. I mean, yeah, I mean, quite literally, sort of babies being fed into this vaccination monster. There's always been misinformation. There was misinformation being sort of given out in the 19th century. So it was absolutely huge um, at this time. There's a number of uh, magazines which are devoted simply to the idea of, of vaccines. So one that's called quite literally the anti-vaccinator um, and another one, the Vaccination Inquirer, which carries on for about 50 years, which is in incredible, really. I think that's, that's still an issue today. Um, people don't always necessarily respond to scientific evidence. People create their own narratives around medicine and health and what they think is, is right for, the, for their family. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think that this is a picture done by a scientist or an artist? An artist. Yes. My name is Dr Lizzie Burns and I call myself a science-based artist. I love working with young people because you don't really know what they're going to create but I know if you give good art materials that good things will emerge, but I never know what will emerge. And that, that's, it's almost a bit like the science. You don't know what's gonna happen. So we're gonna imagine a pharmacy of the future. And it's really down to your imagination. Then I kind of came up with the idea of just past, present and future. It's just a really simple way of looking at things. And I hope it's encouraging that curiosity to learn. That's what education should be, it should be about. The project obviously is exploring to some extent viruses and vaccines, but, but um, I've certainly been impressed by their artwork too. These are fantastic. Yeah. We can't wait.
wait to see you all again next week. We'll be doing something new again around on the same theme. Still all on the theme of vaccines and bacteria, but these look amazing, so well done. Great, great snowmen as well. So. It's been a really lovely experience, a really lovely group of real characters, um, which is, it's been really warming and it's been inspiring to see. Um, so I'm Robin, uh, I'm a children's doctor and a researcher and my research is at Dunn School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're going to work through a variation of a real clinical case that I've been involved with as the doctor. I'm going to share some of the sort of decision making and how we approach that situation with you all here and I'm really excited to see what you think. So Sarah is an otherwise healthy young child. She's been exposed to infection X. She's at high risk of getting it. So what happens if she gets it? Some are fine, their immune system deal with it, some kids. Some will be ill, they'll work out okay. Some can get really quite ill and they can have long-term health issues and they can't do all the things that they would have liked to have done in life. And sadly, some can die. So let's say here you've got 24 hours after you've been exposed to make the decision about whether Sarah has the vaccine or not. But Sarah's parents <coughs> assert that all vaccines are harmful and they don't want her to have the vaccine. So some of you are going to be child advocates some of you are going to take the doctor's viewpoint and then some of you are going to take the parent's perspective. The best interest in the child would probably be to give the vaccine if they've had like wow, high success rates and things like that. Um, but it could, yeah, yeah, I feel like I agree with both of you guys because it could like affect the relationship with the parent. So the issues we discussed with giving the vaccine is, uh, would, could strain the relationship between the parent and the child but also strain the relationship between the parents and the medical profession so they may be less likely to bring their child in in the future to the medical profession. So I was very much for yeah, the right of the child beforehand. <clears throat> and I guess this sort of reflected that. Um, but um, I now, I think, understand more that consideration for the parents and cultural differences are also important. Even if I didn't necessarily change my viewpoint, I think I became more understanding of more people's points of view than just mine. And maybe the question is, should the parent be allowed to make the wrong decision? We have to weigh up the fact that actually her dying or her long-term effects are only two of the possible outcomes and that as a healthy child she's probably already quite protected. But then you could argue that the neg I think the negative outcomes are so bad that it justifies using the kind of out more outcome of weighing up the positive and negatives because the negatives are so bad in this instance. The professional's opinion is sort of relatively clear, the parent's opinion is relatively clear, and so to resolve this you need a third party who is a degree of objectivity and distance from the situation. In particular scenarios where the parameters are very specific and it's a very specific vaccine for a very specific illness, um, the court has um, said that the child should get the vaccine. Um, but you can't generalise from that to any vaccine scenario because it was a very specific one. Um, I, I didn't agree with half of you and I did agree quite strongly with the other half of you and I think it's really really interesting we've all looked at the same issue and in good faith we've all come to slightly different which does you know does really raise the question philosophically of kind of who is the expert who really does know. Um, I love the idea that you have to take it away from the individual doctors or from the medical team and take you do have to take it to higher authority so that it doesn't become personal beat between them and the between them and the parents. But thank you. Thank you very much. Can we give a big round of applause to all of you? So you've got the Latin name, that's great. And a common name. So that would be known as sweet... Sweet wormwood. Wormwood. But these plants are full of all sorts of interesting chemicals, so there may be loads more new medicines that we don't know about. Yeah. <laughs> We went there with the students in Oxford to especially look at the plants that have medicinal value. So the plants that are used in medicines of all different varieties that come out of these gardens. <laughs> Oh, 
It's a herb where we use for ukuma. When ukuma, we mostly get steaming, as my partner said. So let's say it in Zulu. Can you please pronounce ukuma? I can't do this. Ukuma. It's like ukuma. Yes. That's good. Hi, everyone. So my name is Kingsley Orievulu. I'm from the Africa Health Research Institute here, ARI, okay, and I'm a social scientist, and I'm leading the Infected Minds Project here. The vaccines help your body, the, the human body, to understand um, a, a disease and be ready to, to fight it when it comes. Before we had vaccination, um, there, there was a process called inoculation in the 18th century, where people used um, pus from smallpox scabs to put into their own body. So the, the practice of inoculation was present in parts of India, China, um, parts of Africa as well. And that kind of practice, which is the earliest kind of vaccination, has been done in Africa a long time before it started to happen in Europe. So personally, my vote is for Africa as the first vaccine. I am Sipila Ngekosim Chali, they call me Spila. I am the programming manager. It's one of the things that we, I loved about this program. They were also learning about the science, learning about how the vaccines are made, when were they made, all that history. What might a vaccine of the future look like? Is it still going to be a jab? Could it be done some other way? There's obviously something very much about a needle which everyone dislikes and it, it feels horrible. It looks horrible. <laughs> so is there a better way of doing it? And we're really interested to see what ideas that they come up with. Can you come up with an idea that would be a better way of taking a vaccine which wouldn't be so unpleasant? That's a really good idea. Is scary, but but um, I have learnt that there are other ways to have vaccines, and you don't have to get the needle unless there is no other way. But um, you can have pills, you can drink medicines. In future, the medicine will be like in searches or something like they'll be in searches and put in food or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So one example that's really interesting is um, whether we can make vaccines in food. So instead of having to inject it, you can you can eat it. They can expand like a lot of things. Like they can create more like gadgets to, to like to do you normal know, injections to give us medicines. I'd really love to welcome um, a new way, which is robot injections. I really love robots and working with um, technical stuff. We're gonna make it that it's very friendly with humans as well, and we'll have reassuring samples on it that hey, it's okay. Robot um, injections are not as painful as you think they are. We never stop learning, and I've learned so much today about traditional medicines, about your amazing ideas for the future, so thank you so much. It is really brilliant what you've done and so I've loved seeing all the drawings, all your thoughts, all your experiences. Someone asked me about how to be a scientist and I said you've all got it in this room, any one of you, because I'm hearing such questions and enthusiasm and hard thinking and problem solving and creativity and that's what science is about right so you any of you in this room you can you can follow that passion the idea of preventing a disease seems fantastic to me particularly when you've seen such suffering around the world but you know that's not the case for everybody and i think understanding other people's views is really important um, how else how else are we going to help change things? Vaccines are never ever just about medicine they're about society culture and history as well and I hope through this project that we're showing that. We would be delighted if we can glean something from this which really informs policy so how do we collectively take forward and tackle vaccine hesitancy how do we provide better public health messaging that's actually accessible, relevant and acceptable. Um, and I think the, the commonalities and differences between the UK and South Africa will be an amazing learning experience when we, when we collate at the end of the project um, what we've learned from that as well.